One of the true mysteries of twins is the connection they share beyond that of typical siblings. While the bond between twins is unique, there are also stories of some incredible telepathic qualities they possess. When one experiences trauma, be it physical or psychological, oftentimes the other can sense or experience those same feelings. We've heard stories of twins who have lost touch with each other for extended periods of time, that when they reconnect they find that they've married someone with the same first name, or they've bestowed the same names upon their children. Freaky. This next story is about exactly that type of psychic bond, but one that has a darker element that manifested itself in bizarre behaviors and ultimately resulted in murder. This is extremely strange. On Friday, May 16, 2008, two Swedish twin sisters, Sabina and Ursula Eriksson, traveled from Sabina's home in County Cork, Ireland, to Liverpool, England. Ursula had made the trip to her sister's home from her own in the United States, where she had taken up residence in the year 2000. The twins were born in Sweden in 1976, and by all accounts lived a pretty normal life there. There were no claims of any trouble with the law, or drug use, or mental health issues, at least none that were diagnosed. They arrived in Liverpool, it's assumed, by ferry, on Saturday, May 17th, around 8.30 a.m., the sisters visited the St. Anne Police Station, where Sabina filed a report expressing her concern about her children's safety and well-being back in Ireland, having just had a nasty confrontation with her husband before leaving home. Officials in Dublin were contacted, and the authorities pledged to keep a watchful eye on things there. Perhaps this is what prompted the sisters to travel to Liverpool, but that remains speculative, and it's assumed their families were at least aware of their visit, if not the actual decision to file domestic complaint. By 11.30 a.m., Sabina and Ursula boarded a London-bound bus, and according to the driver, both passengers began to act rather strangely. Both had refused to place their bags in the outside compartments as required, and were clutching them very protectively and defensively. As trained to do, the driver then asked to inspect the bags, suspecting there may be something treacherous and perhaps potentially deadly afoot. The twins refused to allow the search, and as a result were ordered off the bus when it reached the Kiel service station. The twins later said they simply got off for a restroom break as they weren't feeling well but obviously there is some dispute over that assertion. Still exhibiting erratic behavior, they drew the attention of the service manager, who, concerned that they might be carrying some sort of explosive device, contacted the police, who upon arriving at the station, took down the manager's statement and then turned their attention to the women. They questioned them, examined their belongings, and concluded they posed no immediate threat to anyone and that no offense had been committed, so they were free to go about their business. They chose to leave the station on foot and headed for the M6 highway, one of England's busiest thoroughways. A traffic security camera picked them up walking down the median, dividing east and westbound lanes of travel. When they began to cross the lanes on foot, and Sabina was grazed by a red sedan in her attempt to do so, Panicked drivers began to call the highway agency to report what was taking place. One can only imagine those calls. Yes, I'd like to report a couple of doffed women out here trying to cross the motorway on foot. You need to send someone out immediately to sort this out. Right then. Highway agency officers were dispatched to the scene along with the Central Motorway Police Group, who just so happened to have as passengers a camera crew from the BBC show Motorway Cops, the British version of the US program Cops. Officers stopped both sisters and had a conversation concerning the dangerous ramifications of their actions, both to them and the public. And for a time, things appeared well under control, 
as the sisters each smoked a cigarette and spoke with the authorities cordially. As this was taking place, more officers showed up to the scene, and in the process of being briefed about the situation, Ursula suddenly, without a word, began to dart into the oncoming traffic. An officer attempted to hold her by the jacket, but her momentum pulled it off her own back. She then ran directly into the path of an oncoming truck, traveling at around 60 miles per hour, who literally ran her over. Mere seconds later, as police were both astonished and horrified at what they just witnessed, Sabina ran into the road, where she was struck by a Volkswagen vehicle and launched into its windshield with such force the impact smashed it. Officers, almost all but convinced they now had double fatalities on their hands, attended to the women, Observing that both Ursula's legs had been crushed as a result of her impact with the truck, as Sabina lay totally unconscious. Miraculously, both were still alive. Now, I don't know about you, but I've had to go lie down for an hour after I stubbed my toe. True story. An air ambulance was immediately dispatched to the scene to airlift both parties to intensive care and within 15 minutes of her collision with the Volkswagen windshield, Sabina regained consciousness. She immediately lashed out, punching, clawing, and spitting at the officer tending to her and desperately trying to restrain her. She began screaming hysterically things like, I know you, you're not real, and going on about someone stealing her vital organs. As the astonished officers looked on, she suddenly rose to her feet and began to scream for the police, seemingly unaware they were already there trying to assist her. A female officer was doing her best to subdue and calm Sabina, who was asking her, Why do you kill me? At that point, Sabina punched the officer, knocking her down, and bolted onto the median and into the next lane of traffic, which thankfully had ground to a halt when more officers took control of traffic. She was pursued by officers who eventually cornered her. She responded by taking off the jacket she was wearing and squaring off as if to fight them. Eventually, she was restrained with the help of some civilian motorists, six in all, and placed into handcuffs. At this point, Ursula, who astonishingly attempted at least once to get up, despite both legs being mangled, was flown to a nearby hospital while Sabina was transported by ambulance. The attending officers were amazed at the almost superhuman strength displayed by the women and wondered if they were on some sort of drug. The immediate area was scoured for any type of clue or residue that might explain what they had just witnessed, but the search only turned up some busted cell phones and their purses. Despite their prior reluctance to part with the bags, nothing suspicious or unusual was found among their contents. Ursula was immediately brought into surgery, and doctors were just as astonished as the police, and us, she was still alive. Sabina was examined, and then five hours later released into police custody. Her demeanor at the hospital was the complete opposite of what it was at the accident scene. She was calm and even jovial with hospital staff, even going so far as to flirt with a male attendant. She didn't at any time inquire about her sister's condition, but did say something very disturbing. Quote, We see in Sweden that an accident rarely comes alone. Usually at least one more follows, maybe two. The following day at her court appearance, Sabina pled guilty to assaulting a police officer and trespassing on the highway. She was ordered to spend one day in police custody. This was, in essence, her total term of sentence, and during that time, she received no psychiatric evaluation. Now, I don't know much about the criteria in the UK for getting a psych eval, but I would think that trying to cross the motorway on foot and throwing yourself into the path of an oncoming truck, then asking the police to contact the police might be grounds to consider it. At some point? Now released from custody, Sabina was free to walk the streets of Stoke-on-Kent, England, with $1,300 in her possession 
as well as a laptop in a plastic bag. Around 7 p.m. that night, she saw two men, Glenn Hollensheed and Peter Malloy, out walking a dog. She approached them to ask if they could recommend a place for her to stay the night, and Glenn, a paramedic and former RAF airman, seeing the condition and appearance Sabina was in, assumed that perhaps she was some poor denizen with little to her name, and offered his home for the night. While inside Glenn's flat, Sabina began to again display erratic behavior, continually peeking out the window as if in a state of paranoia about someone perhaps following and observing her. She would offer each man a cigarette, only to quickly snatch them from their mouths, proclaiming they were poisonous, and then go on to smoke them herself. Malloy left the flat around midnight, and Sabina stayed the night. Around 8 p.m. the following night, Glenn prepared dinner and, not having any tea bags, went over to his neighbor Frank Booth's house to borrow some. He did indeed get the tea bags, but soon afterwards staggered back outside bearing a knife wound, telling Frank, she stabbed me. Unfortunately, Glenn never made it to the hospital and died there in front of his neighbor, his last words being, look after my dog for me. He was stabbed five times in total with a butcher's knife. Frank Booth immediately called 999 while Sabina fled the scene. She was seen running by a motorist named Joshua Grottage. He claimed she was hitting herself in the head with a hammer at random moments. He attempted to restrain her from harming herself, but claimed he was struck by a roof tile Sabina had hidden in her pocket. Now that paramedics had arrived and were giving chase, Sabina kept running until she came to a bridge and, climbing over the railing, jumped 40 feet down onto the A-50 highway, breaking both her ankles and fracturing her skull. The psych evaluation is looking a lot better now, isn't it? She was rushed to Royal Stoke University Hospital and, as before, toxicology tests revealed no drugs or alcohol in her system that could have triggered the stabbing, self-abuse, or jumping off the highway overpass. Sabina was placed under arrest on charges of murder on June 6, 2008. She was actually taken into custody on September 11th after recovering from her injuries and transported into the jail in a wheelchair. Her trial was delayed from February 2009 until September 1st when her medical records from Sweden were delayed in arriving. She pled guilty to manslaughter with diminished responsibility, and under repeated questioning she uttered the same response. No comment. The defense and prosecution angles were interesting in that both agreed she was insane at the time of the murder, but not here at the trial. Her defense attorneys claim she was a victim of what is known as folle à deux, a French term meaning a madness of two and claiming her insanity was transmitted to her from her twin sister Ursula, citing many examples of twins sharing a form of psychological conjoinment. The prosecution accepted that explanation, and Sabina received five years in prison to be served at Bronzefield Women's Prison. The presiding Judge Saunders claimed Sabina had a serious mental illness, which resulted in aberrant behavior that had nonetheless resolved itself quickly and that, medically speaking, her culpability for her actions was low. Her delusions had dictated her behavior and there was little she could do to avoid the onset of them. Oh, now you might have considered her as momentarily insane? This is what made you turn? Although receiving five years in prison, she was released the following year in 2011 after spending just 439 days in jail. While there, it said she turned to Christianity. She never offered any explanation for her bizarre behavior or why she would stab a man to death that had extended her some kindness. Upon her release, her whereabouts are currently unknown. In that same time frame, her sister Ursula was being released from the hospital after a long, arduous recovery from surgery. She was subsequently deported to Sweden until relocating back in the United States where she had previously been living. Ursula was never charged with a crime, 
but turning to a life of faith, she joined Sacred Heart Church in Bellevue, Washington, where, as a member, she remains quite active there. In December of 2012, someone anonymously uploaded video footage from the BBC show Motorway Cops to the internet, and what was not seen during the airing of the episode pointed out at least one serious flaw in this investigation. In the video, two officers are on camera saying that the twins should be given a 136, which translated means that police can detain an individual who is suspected of exhibiting a mental health breakdown and require a mental health assessment. For whatever reason, this never happened. Sabina was released and went on to murder Glenn Hollensheed. This despite her clearly being a danger to herself and others. This has convinced many people that the police told the producers who shot the film to omit that part from the episode. Now, it's not like we don't understand what happened that day or in the days to follow, and the theory of Foley Adu actually makes some sense in the absence of any other rational explanation to explain the women's actions on this day. Why Sabina Erickson was released from custody without any type of psychiatric evaluation is beyond understanding. If there was a cover-up, someone should have answered to it. But no one has, and poor Glenn Hollensheed paid the ultimate price for that. Both Sabina and Ursula returned to their lives, and who knows what the future holds for them. But it remains a stark reminder that sound mental health is critical at every point in life, from childhood to adolescence to adulthood. And while the case of the Erickson sisters may be pointed to as an aberration, Almost 50% of Americans at some point in their lifetime will be diagnosed as having some type of mental illness or disorder. If you or someone you know is experiencing some form of mental illness, you can get help. And here are some of the ways you can do that.